Bienvenue à la session scientifique du département de médecine familiale de l'Université d'Ottawa. La session se veut bilingue. Vous êtes invité à poser vos questions dans la langue de votre choix. Bonne session! Cette présentation sera enregistrée et est disponible sur la chaîne YouTube du département de médecine familiale. En poursuivant la session, vous consentez à être enregistré si votre caméra ou microphone est activé. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the Department of Family Medicine YouTube channel. By continuing the session, you are consenting to be recorded if your camera or microphone is activated. Nous sommes réunis aujourd'hui à partir de nombreux endroits différents et dans un espace virtuel. Mais nous désirons commencer par reconnaître les terres sur lesquelles se trouve le département de médecine familiale de l'Université d'Ottawa, qui font partie du territoire traditionnel non cédé du peuple Anishinaabe algonquin. Nous vous invitons à réfléchir à votre propre emplacement au Canada par rapport au territoire où vous vous trouvez aujourd'hui. Nous reconnaissons aussi les gardiens des savoirs traditionnels, jeunes et âgés. Nous honorons leurs courageux dirigeants d'hier, d'aujourd'hui et de demain. Akonongum egawikad ki migwewaj. Nimanajianig kakina anishnabig undaje kaye ogog kakina eniagizig enikuka mikak kanadang eje udapinagig endawajin udawan. We are gathered today from many different locations and in a virtual space. But we wish to begin by recognizing the land on which the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Ottawa is located, which is part of the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. We invite you to think about your own location in Canada in relation to the territory where you find yourself today. We also acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders past, present and future. Bonjour, bienvenue tout le monde. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to November uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Doug Archibald, I'm the Director of Research and Innovation for the department, and I'll be the moderator of today's session. It's my privilege to introduce our two speakers uh, for uh, this morning's event. Uh, first will be uh, Dr. Pil Zhu. Uh, Dr. Ju is a family emergency physician at the Ottawa Hospital, Queensway Carleton Hospital, and Arne Pryor District Memorial Hospital. He's a clinician investigator at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, and his research interests include delirium, antibiotic stewardship, and machine learning. He's a father of two, enjoys sour bread baking, and is an amateur radio operation among many hobbies. So without further ado, I will pass things over to you, Pill. Good morning. Thank you for uh, inviting me um, and welcome to everybody. So this is a um, study that I've been uh, working on recently, uh, uh, well, for the last two years. Um, I thank the Department of Family Medicine for uh, the generous support in funding uh, in the form of a prime uh, grant. Um, so uh, this was a health record review um, looking into the effect of inpatient antibiotic treatment among uh, delirious older adults uh, who were also found with a positive urinalysis. So I'll go into a little bit more detail down the road, exactly what I was trying to do. But let's start with um, uh, the background uh, story. So um, the delirium is common uh, presentation. Uh, it, it is uh, approximated that about 10% of the ED visits will uh, involve some uh, or have patients will have uh, delirium. And it is also estimated that 20 to 40 percent of admitted older adults in the hospital will have a delirium at one point. Um, another point is that asymptomatic bacteria is common. So an asymptomatic bacteria, uh, the definition of that is that you found bacteria in the urine, 
even though nothing is otherwise wrong with you. So in other words, what we used to call a colonization. Uh, so this is quite common. I mean, urine is supposedly supposed to be um, sterile, but uh, that's not often the case, especially in older adults uh, and for whom there's a uh, presence of asymptomatic bacteria up to 25 to 50%. Um, the rate goes up if you're institutionalized or you have more comorbidities. The only uh, population with asymptomatic bacteria that has shown to benefit from antibiotic treatment are pregnant women. Uh, otherwise, there so far has been no evidence showing that screening or treating of asymptomatic bacteria in older adults is uh, beneficial in any ways. And, and it, there has been uh, evidence of harm. So, when older patients are doing fine, there's no reason to check for bacteria in the urine. There's no reason to treat it if you find it. But the question is often comes up is, what if they are delirious? Should you check for the bacteria in the urine and do something about that? The problem with that is that two um, common things uh, also happen commonly together. So can you see my cursor? Okay, perfect. So delirium is something that's common in older adults. Asymptomatic bacteria is also common in older adults. So then there's a huge overlap where these two common things will also happen just by chance uh, occurrence alone. So then again, the question is, what if we have an older person with delirium and also found with bacteria? Is this UTI? Uh, or is this just chance, chance occurrence? Um, so there have been a few studies on delirium and UTI, whether that's a real thing or that's not a real thing. Uh, we're not talking about obviously sepsis or urosepsis. I mean, um, I'm, uh, we could easily assume that that could make anybody sick and uh, confused. But when it came to simple UTI could that cause delirium, but no other symptom. That's kind of really the question. Um, so unfortunately, many studies that have come before um, lacked consistent case definition of UTI and delirium, and many lacked comparison groups. So many studies have shown if you give antibiotics, they do get better. But then question is, well, were they supposed to get better anyway? And no studies have as far as I know, there has been no studies that looked into what antibiotic um, does to delirium per se. I mean, a lot of studies have looked at other um, aspects such as a functional decline, but not delirium as measured. Uh, to sum that up, so far there has been no, there's no evidence uh, that supports that uh, treating this population improves delirium resolution. Um, okay, so let's look at some guidelines, uh, again, more for the background. So this is uh, Association of Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases of Canada guideline. So we will look at this section. I'll zoom it up uh, later. But uh, the first question they ask is, do you have symptoms such as uh, acute dysuria, uh, and fever, urgency, frequency. And let's go down this no section. And when we zoom it up, this uh, guideline says, if there's cognitive functional changes, but no symptoms, do not assume. They're basically asking uh, clinicians to look for other things before blaming UTI on the cognitive changes. Let's look at BC guideline. This is a uh, 2020 guideline last year. Uh, this is urinary tract infections in the primary care setting. Uh, so again, no UTI symptoms in elderly, functionally, or cognitively impaired uh, with new delirium, new confusion, new faults. BC guideline actually goes as far as saying, just do not worry about it. Don't test it. Don't give antibiotics. Just don't worry about it in terms of UTI. I mean, Obviously, you should look into why they're having all these problems, but they're saying it's probably not UTI. Now, having said that, this guideline, and these are consistent with also uh, IDSA guidelines, many other guidelines, uh, choosing wisely. But 
uh, these are strong recommendations, but uh, based on weak evidence. As I said, a uh, lot of studies had some methodological problems. So just uh, for the sake of time, I don't have, uh, I'll just show you a few studies that uh, we know. So this is, I think, 2017 studies uh, that uh, from the, uh, the Spukta. Um, it was a prospective study from London, Ontario. And uh, this, uh, the, they looked into older delirious patients pro that probably acquired delirium during hospitalization, which is somewhat different from my study where I looked at people who came with uh, delirium. Anyway, this study showed antibiotic treatment of asymptomatic bacteria correlated with poor functional outcome. And uh, poor functional outcome being defined as that's uh, placement into the uh, long-term care or somewhat of a functional decline. So, but they have shown some correlation with uh, doing worse when you get antibiotics. Although again, uh, there was no direct measurement for delirium resolution. And here's a uh, shameless self-promotion. This is a paper that will come out in December in uh, Canadian Geriatrics Journal uh, that I did with a medical student who's just graduating. Uh, um, so we looked at emergency department at the TOH uh, and we did a health record review. We have found 499 older adults presenting with confusion or similar. And we wanted to see how many of them get urine test, uh, you get UTI diagnosis and antibiotics. And we, we look at asymptomatic subgroup that did not have any urinary symptoms, no fever or other infectious diagnosis. So they're basically group that had asymptomatic bacteria, if they had a positive urine. These people had 60%, almost 60% uh, of them got some kind of urine test, whether urinalysis or a culture. The 7.6% uh, still were diagnosed with a UTI, even though they had no uh, otherwise symptom other than confusion. And then more than double number of UTI diagnoses got antibiotics, even though they don't really have reason to get antibiotics. Again, unless you, we believe that confusion is a, a symptom of UTI, which is, we're about to prove or disprove. And this study also showed that uh, when you give antibiotics, there's a correlation with admission, 30-day mortality, weak, but uh, also six-month mortality. So is this well, we can prove causality, but uh, there definitely was a trend uh, that uh, linked uh, antibiotics with these uh, uh, worse outcomes. Um, another study I was um, uh, part of uh, that was uh, from uh, Laval University. Uh, this was again, hot off the press in May, 2021 this year. Uh, uh, we surveyed 297 Canadian physicians in emergency medicine, mostly emergency and family medicine, and also some in internal and geriatrics. And this showed that 40%, more than 40% would always check urine if somebody comes, uh, some delirious patients are present to our door, and 40 more percent frequently. So 80% of people will likely do urine tests if we have a confused uh, or delirious uh, adult, older adult. And then what do we give antibiotics if the urine is positive? 40% said we will, they would give antibiotics. 12 more percent uh, said, if we don't find anything else, we'll, I would give. And then 33% more if culture is positive. So, Large majority of patient, uh, physicians in Canada surveyed would treat if the urine is positive uh, with some caveats, but yeah. So, I mean, that's what we actually do. So, I mean, this is a very common practice um, uh, shown in many other studies and also obviously very uh, recent studies at our door, essentially. So, what, do, what did I want to do? Let me just check my time. Um, I wanted to see the inpatient uh, population in our hospital, at the, at the auto hospital, uh, that have positive urinalysis, positive delirium screen. What do we do? What do they look like? Do they get antibiotics? And then how many of these people actually had other indications for antibiotics, such as symptomatic UTI, fever, other infectious diagnosis? 
And then uh, on top of that, I wanted to see if they get antibiotic versus they do not get antibiotic, does that change anything about their delirium resolution? Uh, this was a health record review uh, at the auto hospital involving family medicine unit and internal medicine uh, inpatient units. Inclusion criteria, 65 years older, as I said, uh, admitted to these two units. Positive delirium screening with a BCAM, brief confusion assessment method. I will explain a little bit more down the road. Uh, and with positive urinalysis, trace loop site or more or nitrate positive. The exclusion criteria involved the having indwelling catheter. These people within a month, you, uh, almost virtually all of them will have a bacteria. So we can't really say much about that. And people who are repeat, who were repeat, uh, admitted repeated, repetitively were uh, uh, included just on the first uh, admission. So the brief confusion assessment method involves these four questions that can be administered quite quickly within a few minutes. This, this whole uh, screen can be done within four minutes. And uh, it's 78% sensitive and 97% specific for delirium. And uh, what we found is that this test is actually performed regularly almost at every shift with our uh, nursing staff at the uh, auto hospitals uh, inpatient units. So this was a very good uh, source of information that we could use in terms of uh, outcome measures. So we wanted to look at antibiotic prescription rate, rate of uh, these uh, additional indications for antibiotics other than the delirium and uh, urinalysis we already started with. And we wanted to look at BCAM on seventh day admission as uh, one of the uh, outcomes uh, and then rate of death ICU uh, awaiting long-term care designation, C. difficile, within the first 30 days of admission. Uh, we created uh, standardized uh, electronic red, uh, data abstraction form on this uh, red cap platform, which is freely available, available on the uh, TOH uh, server. Uh, we did some pilot on December 20, 2019 data for further re refinement and then collected data uh, from January to December 2019. Uh, 2020, we had uh, two medical students um, uh, doing uh, most of the abstraction uh, with a family medicine resident and myself also helping out with uh, um, uh, details. We had a code book uh, created for data abstraction for consistency. And then we also had 33% of the charts where both medical students independently abstracted on the same patients to uh, calculate CAPA statistics. Uh, typical things, uh, descriptive statistics were in means and um, standard deviation, or we also uh, showed proportions uh, uh, when where it's appropriate. We did t-tests or Fisher's exact test for uh, significance when necessary. As we mentioned, we did CAPA statistics. When, uh, so these are more for uh, what, for descriptive stat statistics, uh, descriptions of we use uh, mean, uh, means and standard deviation, but we also did comparative analysis where the exposure was antibiotic treatment and comparison group was no antibiotic treatment. Everything, uh, all the analysis was done in R. So this is a main flow diagram. We found 183 patients that met inclusion criteria and excluded 33 and ended up with 150. And of which large majority, 86% received antibiotics. It's not too, um, too surprising. And of all the cases, um, we found that 62% had additional uh, indication for antibiotics, such as UTI, fever, whether reported, measured, uh, other infectious diagnoses. I mean, we're being a bit conservative. We're, I mean, because it's a chart study, we didn't really go into was it appropriate or not. Um, at this point, we just took it at the face value, what was uh, the documented. And also note that these are not mutually exclusive. As you will see that if you add it all up, it's not gonna be 62%. And then 38% had no additional indication, meaning that these people likely had asymptomatic bacteriuria. Okay, and on the... The seventh day of admission, when we looked at these people, so people with the antibiotic had 22% positivity on BCAM on the day seven, no antibiotics, 
24%. So very similar. I mean, OR odds ratio was very close to one. But then the question is, is this a valid comparison? Um, are these two population, people who are given antibiotics or not given antibiotics, were they similar uh, other, other than the antibiotics? Well, let's go back to this, how many people had uh, additional indications for antibiotics. We looked at, it was about 60-40 split, 60%, 40%. And when we look at people who got antibiotics versus no antibiotics, we find that that's not quite 60-40 split. People who got antibiotics were more like 70-30 split. People who didn't get antibiotics were more like 15% to 85% split. So majority of people with antibiotics had, did have some additional indication for antibiotics. People who didn't get antibiotics, mostly they were asymptomatic otherwise. So this number here, probably not a valid comparison. So I, we said, let's look at the asymptomatic sub, subgroup, okay? So out of 129 who got antibiotics, we found 39 patients who had no additional uh, indication for antibiotics. Same thing in the no antibiotic arm, we found 18 patients who had no other uh, reason for getting antibiotics other than the fact that they had positive urine and delirium. Um, so let's look at these people, this uh, to, to subgroup of asymptomatic people. And we found that in the antibiotic arm, 15% had become uh, positive. And in the non-antibiotic arm, we had 22% uh, uh, become positivity. With OR of points, uh, odds ratio of 0.64, but the, uh, again, the confidence, 95% confidence interval uh, crosses one. So, no obvious difference. I mean, also, the, I mean, it's pretty far from one, one or another. So, still no obvious difference in this population in terms of. So, the question was if you give antibiotics, do they have less delirium? what we found is that not, no evidence to support that idea at this point. Now, having said that, we have to say, look, see that numbers are somewhat small, so we don't, we don't have a great power, but this is a subgroup analysis. Let's look at the complications uh, rate. I mean, they're quite similar mortality, 22 versus 19, um, given the I mean, number of confidence interval of this 19% is quite, quite big. And uh, we didn't find any uh, C. difficile ICU transfer among 21 p uh, patients with a no antibiotic, but then the rate of this in the antibiotic arm was quite small too. The awaiting long-term care designation, they can go back home essentially, uh, was about the same as well. Uh, not a huge difference. So what do we get out of this? I mean, let's check the time. We're still working on the, uh, the manuscript, but what I'm say, seeing here is that if you have admitted patient with delirium positive urinalysis, probably not UTI. I mean, as at least the way we traditionally understand, 20, only 25% had a symptomatic UTI, whereas 50% 50, 50 had an other diagnosis, 38% were asymptomatic. And then big question, does antibiotic treatment affect delirium resolution? We still have no evidence. We didn't have before, we still don't. Is it, is it possible we have a larger study we can show smaller difference? Maybe, but at this point, we cannot say that there is evidence that shows that antibiotic treatment affects delirium resolution. So this study, I mean, uh, with the, for the sake of time, we'll just skip away. So, I mean, I, we try to, make it as robust as possible. The problem is that we have to rely on the chart record given that it's a health record review and subgroup analysis sample was small and uh, may not generalize to other settings. So research implication, we have lots of other work to do. So uh, we're still trying to look into these other infectious diagnoses. Most, most of them were sepsis or pneumonia. And I want to see how accurate this work, because I mean, UTI usually gets overcalled. So how overcalled was the pneumonia and other things. Um, we definitely need a larger study examining this asymptomatic cohorts if you wanted to make a more firmer uh, conclusion. So as a conclusion, 
people who are admitted with delirium positive urine, probably not UTI. Uh, the chances are small. I mean, it's possible, but if you call it UTI, everybody within this population, you call them UTI, then we're probably missing a lot of other things. Still no evidence showing that antibiotic treatment improves delirium, and we need a bigger study. And I'll uh, open the floor for questions. Bill, thank you very much. Congratulations on your two publications and congratulations uh, um, on this study and uh, look forward to that publication too. So yes, please comments, anybody. Leonard. Uh, hi, let me just put on my video here for a sec. Uh, so hi. Hi, Pill. Hi. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I actually, though, you know, I want to ask you in practical terms. Um, we, we, you know, when when we do the when we see people in the hospital and who come in with delirium, the truth is most of the time we don't find a cause at all. And when we talk about symptoms, um, I think like. Most older people have some urinary symptoms anyway. You know, they have frequency or, so, or incontinence. So in practical terms, when, when you have somebody who has a delirium, when you don't find any other cause, it's very hard just to say, I'm not going to treat it. Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, first thing is that uh, the UTI has to be defined as, I mean, traditionally at least, uh, as a new symptoms, I mean, when it comes to urinary symptoms, it has to be new frequency because often people do have frequency, they are in Lasix or whatnot. Uh, so it has to be changed in uh, their symptoms if, uh, if they have a chronic pr problem. So another thing is, yeah, so I mean, that's what I'm trying to do. The problem is that asymptomatic bacteriuria is very common. So, I mean, if older person comes in with a toe pain and their po urine is positive, it's really hard to say that's was the cause of their toe pain, but we tend to do that with delirium, in my opinion. I mean, I'm somewhat biased. Um, so um, that's what I'm trying to show. I mean, I, again, I have to say, we do not have a clear evidence showing that it is not related or it's related one or another. So that's kind of the um, what I'm trying to figure out here. Yeah. Thank you. Great, thank you. So Claire and then Margaret. Okay, uh, yeah, congratulations, Pill. Really nice work. Um, you and I have chatted several times over the past few years where you sort of started with this idea and I've seen you work it through. Um, and I, I think this is really important work. I think, you know, we always wanna do a study where we're gonna find something, um, you know, get our answer. But I think the, you know, no answer or you didn't get a no answer, but your conclusion is really important. Um, and I would encourage you, hopefully, in your publications to really reflect on the overtreatment piece. The so what is that we're overtreating. And then there's all sorts of issues that come from that. Um, so keep going with it. And then the other thing I just wanted to uh, congratulate you on is, you know, the involvement and in using the medical students uh, that you had a resident um, who worked with you on this. So perfect example of how to use, I think, the resources that we all have available to us to start um, uh, and do some uh, academic uh, work, which, as I said, is highly uh, relevant for all family doctors. So great work. Hi, Bill. It's Margaret. Um, I'm just, I'm just um, sort of, I agree with you that we are probably over treating the, uh, the UT, well, we over call UTIs and over treat UTIs in elderly people. But I also find it difficult, really difficult to sort of, uh, when I'm speaking to a delirious person and the symptoms are so subjective, not really measurable, right? Um, to sort of figure out if, if they actually do have new frequency and new urgency, especially when they're delirious, right? So that's, that's part of the problem. So I wonder if there is any sort of um, um, recommendations out there in terms of how do we find out if the patient actually has new symptoms reliably? So I think this is actually in the literature, the reason why people overtreat when it, people are asked, um, often the, it, it, this is published that uh, it's the, yeah, they're delirious, they can, can tell us that is a, often uh, cited as a reason. I think it's a very valid reason. 
Now, having said that, I would counter it in two ways. I mean, I'll, I'll give two, two ways that I think about. First of all, uh, I think many delirious people can still tell you, you know, does it burn when you pee? I mean, unless they're very agitated and confused. I, I feel that they can still tell you, I mean, certain other things like, does your belly hurt? They can tell you if it hurts or not. Um, second thing is family members, uh, nursing staff at the um, uh, nursing home or whatnot can also say, you know, is this person peeing often, you know, more than usual. Um, another thing I would say is that uh, I think what, what we're doing is we assume that if they can tell us they don't have it, but I think it's reasonable in, in, the, in this sense that we don't assume that people have TIA when they can tell us because they're confused. We don't, because I mean, TIA is one of those things you can't see it on the scan. They can't, they're, they're not having symptoms now, but they might have the symptoms. So maybe if we assume that they have UTI because they can tell us, we should maybe also assume the TIA or other things that they can tell us that, that there are symptoms about, but we don't. But I mean, the, I think the difference is that urine is something easy to get. Whereas a CT scan, we do it and we don't see anything. We assume that there's nothing. But urine, again, because the asymptomatic bacteria is so frequent that we do see it. And then the problem is we're stuck with like, oh, it's positive. What do we do now? So I think that uh, that's how I see it personally. But again, there's no uh, clinical evidence or uh, at this point literature to support one or another strongly, I would say. Thank you very much uh, for the conversation, everyone. And uh, please keep the comments going in the chat. I see Doug Manuel's uh, posted a couple of uh, comments and uh, it, keep it going. But I'd like to now introduce our second speaker. Um, and this is uh, Dr. Peggy J. Kleinplatz, who's a professor uh, in, of family medicine in the Faculty of Medicine and director of the Optimal Sexual Experiences Research Team at the University of Ottawa. Her clinical work focuses on eroticism and transformation. Her current research focuses on optimal sex experience with particular interest in sexual health in the elderly, disabled, and marginalized populations. She's a certified sex therapist and educator. Uh, Dr. Kleinpetz has edited four books, including New Directions in Sex Therapy, Innovations, and Alternatives winner of the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists Book Award. She's author with Dr. Menard of Magnificent Sex, Lessons from Extraordinary Lovers in 2020, and winner of the Society for Sex Therapy and Research Consumer Book Award for 2021. So without further ado, over to you, Peggy. Thank you very much. Uh... I appreciate your having me here, and also thanks to Dr. Venable for making it possible for me to actually be here. And we've already heard the Indigenous affirmation in the correct language, so I will leave it to that. I'm very fortunate to have a wonderful uh, research team to work with, and there are about 20 of us. It's quite an interdisciplinary team, but here are the five of us who are responsible for this morning's presentation. And I would encourage you to comment or ask questions in the language of your choice. Also, I've been asked to explain to you that I have disabilities and do not have computer access. So I'm speaking to you from my landline. I will not be able to see the chat. So feel free to jump in with comments or questions whenever you like. And I would also invite my fellow team members to respond to questions in French or English. Now. This is our fourth time up at what used to be called the Research in Progress Rounds, now the Research Grand Rounds. We were first encouraged to do this in 2007 by Dr. Hogg. I'm hoping he's here today. Uh, we've given previous presentations on our work, which started out as straight phenomenological research into couples whose sex lives were getting better and better and better into their 60s, 70s, and 80s whereas most sex therapists study bad sex and how to make it not so bad. But how many of us want sex lives that are not so bad? Um, we started studying people whose sex lives just got better and better. So sexual and gender minorities, as well as people who we had a lot to learn from well into their 80s. So we presented on them in 2007, 
and what factors led to their sex lives getting better and better over time by 2012. And then in 2017, we started to describe our research in which we took the lessons we learned from the people whose sex lives were so incredibly fulfilling and applied them to couples who were really miserable in their sex lives, who were having problems with low desire, no desire, low frequency, or no frequency. And we began to see them in group therapy to try and create the quality of sex that was worth wanting. And today we're here to talk to you about, okay, but what do we do during COVID? So here is a slide from 2017, giving you the background I've just described up until 2012 where we were trying to figure out, can we apply the lessons from the outliers, the key informants, the people we've come to call extraordinary lovers, and see if that could help people who were very unhappy with their low-frequency sex lives and their low or no desire. So back to today, here were the research questions that we had asked previously. And then in bold, second to last, is what we've been working on since 2013. Could we devise a therapy to help patients to experience sex worth wanting? So you'll notice we made the shift from frequency of sex to quality of sex. And then in March of 2020, we say, okay, well, I guess we stopped doing therapy now. We can't see anybody in person. And in fact, I have not seen a patient in person since March 12, 2020. So here's just a bit of background. The most common presenting problem in the office of sex therapists, and certainly the hardest to treat, are problems related to desire and frequency. Most of the interventions historically have treated the identified patient, who's typically diagnosed as the woman with low desire. In real life, we realize it's not that simple, and that in heterosexual couples, the low desire partner is likely to be the woman but only in about 55% of cases, the other 45% are men. There have been some biomedical therapies, notably phlebanserin, which is approved by Health Canada in 2018. If I were in a room with you, I'd say, give me a show of hands. How many of you even heard of it? It's not exactly a popular drug and doesn't seem to work very well. And bromelanotide has not been approved by Health Canada, though it was by the FDA. Mostly for clinicians, we don't have a lot of options. Very often, couples try to solve the problem of low frequency by having more and more sex out of obligation because they know that having more frequent sex helps to make a relationship more stable. However, if you have enough sex without sexual desire, which is doing a favor for your partner, eventually you're going to end up feeling fairly miserable. And the more often you have sex without sexual desire, you end up in a death spiral. So picture imagery from figure skating. You get closer and closer and closer to that cold ice until eventually you just refuse to have sex anymore. So our objective was to create sex worth wanting and to replace the dread that people in that sexual relationship death spiral eventually feel with anticipation. Now, you might be wondering, who are the patients we were seeing? So starting about 2013, as we began treating patients with low desire, no desire, low frequency, no frequency, we started assessing them using the NSSS, the new sexual satisfaction scale, the most um, psychometrically valid and reliable instrument out there. And when we compared our patients to the patients that the NSSS had been Uh, validated on, our patients were really the challenge patients. Their scores were 10 to 12 percent, sorry, raw points lower than the validation sample. So these these were really unhappy people. Four years ago, I gave you this slide showing that on the first 45 patients that we had seen, from pre test to post test, people improved pretty significantly in an eight-week, 16-hour intervention. So pretty much everybody went up quite significantly. And this is published in the Journal of Sexual Medicine, 2020. You'll notice that four people went down. That's because we had tried something that really didn't work, and it's worth saying what didn't work. And that is um, some of the therapists we trained decided to offer this as a treatment in 16 hours, but over 
two consecutive weekends. So four hours on a Saturday, four hours on a Sunday, and the same thing for the following weekend. That was a disaster. Do not try this. Couples need way more than two consecutive weekends to be able to integrate the changes that are going to occur in therapy. So everybody else went up pretty significantly, and we've stopped doing anything but 16 hours over eight weeks. That seems to work. If we have some mottos in our team, one of them is that we need to create just enough safety in couples' relationships so that they're willing to take the risks involved in deep self-revelation with one's partner. In other words, they need to get to know each other all over again, something that most people stop doing by the time they move in together. And to create the conditions such that sex becomes desirable, and we've published a fair bit about this in the last few years, and we'll have a reference list at the end, but we're happy to send you copies of any of our papers. And then COVID. Like, what do we do? How do you do therapy, let alone group therapy, during COVID? Over the course of the last few years, we'd been training therapists. Once our data started to become published, people internationally started contacting us and saying, can you train us? And so far, we've trained about 60 therapists internationally. And I spoke with everybody in March 2020 and said, okay, you know, we stopped therapy. And everyone said to me, hey, um, Peggy, just because you don't uh, use computers doesn't mean the rest of us can't. Why don't we do this by a teletherapy? And I said, that's ridiculous. That'll never work. And they said, well, at least speak to ethics. So I spoke to ethics and I spoke to the college and they said, hey, you've got empirically validated treatment and you're going to stop it when people need it most. Uh, you need to do this. Despite my great hesitation, I said, all right. And we retrained everybody on how to do it during COVID via teletherapy. U Ottawa Ethics was extremely helpful in guiding us as how to do this in uh, ways that would be uh, compliant with the various strictures around teletherapy. So here's what we've got for you. Over the last year and a half, 46 couples have done this couple therapy during COVID using secure end-to-end encrypted PIPIDA, PHIPA, HIPAA-compliant teletherapy. Even I have managed to see patients this way, even though I'm doing it with my landline and my co-therapist, because all of our work is conducted by co-therapist dyads, um, is using Zoom, the high-end Zoom, the one that's um, appropriate for teletherapy. And we use the same outcome measures that we've been using previously, the new sexual satisfaction scale, and we do that at four time points at uh, intake, pre-test, so the day of the first session, post-test, eight weeks later, day of the last session, and at six-month follow-up. And we compared results from uh, pre-test to follow-up and pre, uh, sorry, pre-test to post-test and pre-test to follow-up. We also looked at the individual items on the NSSS, and we continue to use mixed methods, so participants also provided written feedback regarding changes, and here is what we actually do. So it's two hours a week, every week for eight weeks. The first three hours, I guess you'd describe as psychoeducational. We talk about myths around sexuality, myths around what it means to be in a long-term relationship, Um, myths that are promulgated in the media, that what you need to to schedule sex and have date nights. But we move very quickly in hours 3 to 16 from a uh, psychoeducational approach to experiential learning. And we highlighted trying to nurture what we'd found in the Extraordinary Lovers from 2005 to 2012. So the capacity is being utterly embodied, yeah, easy enough to do in a mindfulness class, but not so easy if you're trying to do it during sex while you're connected to another person. The cultivation of trust and especially uh, empathy, touching so as to feel authenticity, vulnerability, and using conflict to promote uh, intimacy. No use of sensate focus and no treatment of the identified patient. So the target of treatment here is the couple. Here's what our data looked like before COVID. 
so significant at 0. 0.001 with a Cohen's D of one point something. So markedly clinically significant, markedly statistically significant, and where the changes were enduring at the six-month follow-up. And how do you like that? Same success rate during COVID, which I find shocking. So if you prefer numbers rather than pictures, here are our results. Uh, no changes on the wait list control, but pretty significant changes before COVID in person and during COVID remotely. So if you look at the bottom line, statistically significant increases in scores from pre-test to post-test and its six-month follow-up looks like the changes are enduring. For us also, there's been a social justice and accessibility um, foundation to everything we've done since 2005. Online groups turn out to be more accessible, so we're seeing more patients more quickly. We've eliminated all our waiting lists. There's no winter driving. So patients are more likely to attend their appointments, less likely to say, sorry, I couldn't make it. And it turns out that we're more accessible to remote communities here in Ontario, so northern Ontario. Also in rural Iowa. So we have therapists all over North America and starting two weeks from now in the UK as well who are offering um, our approach. Also, it turns out to be very cost effective. And the groups are equally effective for heterosexual couples or LGBTQ relationships, and the results show that it remains not only effective in general, where the highest scores are on item 23, what is your satisfaction now with your overall sex life? You can see those numbers look pretty good, probability 0.001, Cohen's D of 1.1. But our participants described improvements in exactly the same variables that we found were critical among the extraordinary lovers in their 60s, 70s, and 80s way back in 2007. So what accounts for the improvement? Here's where we go back to the mixed method, and here is what our participants were telling us in their written feedback. The answer was not focusing on the genitals or on the frequency of sex acts, but rather on the contextual aspects that make sex desirable. So the solution to problems of no desire is creating desirable sex. And the growing awareness that the sex lives of their dreams would require giving up the fantasy that sex could be either natural and spontaneous or schedule everything with Hockey Night in Canada. And... By the time patients walk into my office, they're feeling so defective for not being like what they see in the media. And we ironically had to affirm them for not wanting the relatively lackluster sex they'd been having for years and encourage them not to settle for lousy sex and that the sex that was worth wanting was also worth the effort. So if I have a clinical takeaway for you, it's instead of treating the symptom of low desire, maybe we should think of it as a signpost. And in, I would encourage you to ask your patients, well, what is it that you really want? What changes do you need to make so that sex between you is worth wanting? And to encourage, him, encourage them not to settle, but to know that disappointing sex lives can change and that sometimes low desire, rather than being evidence of psychopathology, is a signpost for good judgment. And here's my request for you. Um, in the time since we've been working online, it's become clear to us that there are some advantages, even to me, notwithstanding my hatred of online anything because of my disabilities. And that is, hey, there are other people who might benefit for online treatment, people who are immunocompromised because they're dealing with cancer and their partners. So our next study beginning in January is to offer remote therapy for couples facing cancer. 
which would allow clinicians to see, again, more couples more quickly and reducing wait times. You as the family physicians know that the oncologists, quite rightly, are trying to save people's lives, but usually don't talk to them about the impact of cancer and its treatment on sexuality and sexual relationships. So that's what we're doing next. Our conclusion is, holy cow, this works. This works, and it works during COVID. So if you're interested in further information or collaborating, there's my phone number. I don't answer emails. You'll just get an automated reply saying I have disabilities and can't do it. So call me. There's my phone number. You can go to our website, optimalsexualexperiences.com, which will give you the email address of our research team coordinator or my phone number. There also you see the name of the book that our team has written about this. And if I can ask you for a favor, um, if you're seeing any patients who have cancer or their partners has already been approved by U of O Ethics, please refer them to our team or contact me. And thank you. Uh, that's me in the corner there. And if you want our references, here are just a few. Peggy, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, well, I, I, I've got a question if we can start. Um, and that's uh, where are we going as we start to move into um, post-pandemic? Um, considering the points that you made around uh, social justice and accessibility, will online continue? Well, I've heard from so many people in remote communities that are saying, hey, I wouldn't normally have access to this kind of treatment where I live. At the very minimum, we want to continue to offer these groups to people who will need remote access to the kinds of people who've been trained to offer this. So that's definitely yes. As for people who live in large cities, if they would like to return to in-person services, we intend to offer that as well. Okay, thank you. Turn, so it'll oh, be patient's oh, choice. Patient choice, great. Thank you. So moving on now, uh, Claire Liddy, then Claire Kendall. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, really nice talk. I loved how you distilled your kind of program of research in your area of interest and sort of took us through the journey to now the current question and congratulations on um, such wonderful results. Um, there's two things that I Thank wanted you. to mention. One thing is that it really strikes me, I do a lot of work in chronic disease self-management and that was also or is a in-person course that even pre-pandemic had also offered an online option. Um, so that's the, uh, living with a chronic, living well with a chronic disease. And I'm just, I think there's a lot of um, parallels in terms of the results, at, which were also positive on that one. So I'm not sure if you've seen that literature or um, this was a program developed for people with arthritis um, originally out of Stanford. So again, very similar results to what you found. Um, the, the second comment I have is that, um, I'm very happy at the department level to put an add in in terms of the recruitment um, for your study for people living with cancer. And then I'm wondering as well if you've connected with Dr. Anna Wilkinson, who is the new primary care lead for our region for um, with Cancer Care Ontario. And if not, I'm happy to do an e introduction uh, to support your study. Thank you so much. In response to your first comment, yes, I am familiar with that. And um, if, if you're interested in collaborating, if anyone here is interested in collaborating around chronic illness, that's long been a focus of our research. Uh, we were surprised in the original studies back from 2005 to 2012 how many of the people we'd seen in their 60s, 70s, and 80s who self-defined as having really wonderful sex lives were chronically ill. In fact, one or two were palliative. So... Yeah, if anyone is interested in collaborating, that would be great. And uh, if you would be so kind as to introduce me to Anna Wilkinson, please just give her my phone number. Yeah, I'll do that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Peggy. So I had uh, three comments and a question for you. Um, my first was just echoing Claire's happy to share any information that gets circulated with our group. 
Um, and just want to say, I really always love how you have such a, a family medicine approach to your work. It's uh, always really interesting to me to hear you speak in what I think of as family medicine language. So grateful for that. And just if I can um, be like vulnerable for a moment with you, just now that I'm in a role that thinks about how we uh, embrace different kinds of abilities, it's always uh, really um, humbling to hear how you talk about your disability so openly and thinking about how you know, we're coaching learners and unveiling different kinds of abilities and disabilities. Um, it's uh, really important that your voice is maybe more important than you might even realize um, in that space. And my question for you was around how often you have people in your um, studies who are on SSRIs, because that's one area where, you know, there's often intersection in physical mental health, um, and then the, the concomitant potential um, interplay of being on an SSRI or medication that affects, uh, you know, desire. Uh, thank you for your first comment. Thank you, especially for your second comment. Someone contacted me last week and said, you realize everyone thinks you're just a technophobe. You better tell them the truth. So that's why I did that today. And I'm glad it didn't backfire because I felt stupid about telling everybody that I'm uh, dealing with disabilities in public. So thank you, thank you, thank you for encouraging me. And third, 80% of my patients are on SSRIs. That's why I was really reluctant to believe that there was any possibility for change. Um, the good news is that when your sex life improves, you feel a lot less depressed. So very, very slowly over time, that means a six to nine month period, I'm working with the family doc or the prescribing physician to slowly, slowly, slowly help the patient taper in most cases off of the SSRI or maybe switch over to something well, like Wellbutrin that doesn't have the same sexual side effects. So that's a decision to be made by the family doc. And I'm working with the family doc so that we can help the person but for those who don't get off of the meds, they still see improvement in their sex lives, much to my astonishment, though it isn't going to be as huge a difference statistically or clinically as those who are no longer on the meds. And right now I do in fact have a graduate student who's studying uh, SSRIs and sexual dysfunction. Thanks, Peggy. Yes, thank you. Thank Thank you, Peggy, and a uh, big thanks to uh, Pill as well. Um, and thank you all for the great conversations. I can see now we're a couple minutes uh, past the hour. Um, so I'll draw um, rounds to a close. Uh, please do uh, tune in uh, next month for, uh, for rounds. And um, I wish you all a, a great day. <laughs>